thank you for giving me the opportunity to tell you a little bit about what we are doing at Ariane Group in, in R&T, especially on, on rocket propulsion, because that's my special domain. I'm working on liquid propulsion. Um, maybe just to shortly give you something about my background. I have done a PhD at Technical University of Munich in 2007, and then I joined the Presid as a company that was Astrium Space Transportation in those days here in Ottobrunn. And basically for the last, well, now it's 13 years already, I always worked in R&T on liquid propulsion topics. So I'm specialized on combustion, injection, ignition topics, material science and stuff like that. You will see that when I, when I go to the examples later on. But first, let me explain you a little bit about the, the missions we fly and the challenges we have to face. Uh, maybe we start with a launch video where you can see how the different propulsion systems we need to bring us up into the space are operated. And I hope I can scream across the, the video going on to explain you a little bit what is going on. So we're starting in the last countdown. Nerf, wait, now set, six, cinq, quatre, trois, deux, unité, top. Allumage moteur Vulcan. Allumage UAP et top décollage. Les paramètres bons sont conformes à l'attente du bateau. local time and right on time you thought Ariane 5 began her mission roaring off from the ground here in French Guiana with a lot of fire going up through the thin cloud layer we had so much rain today we didn't think we'd have any visibility at all but look at her go she's carrying two satellites two new telecom satellites the two boosters providing 90 that's 90 percent of our thrust right now propelling the also essential information during the slower um uh, sebastian sorry uh, the the video was quite loud and you're quite quiet so uh, i don't think many people heard it but maybe you could walk through a couple of the steps that you just saw because yeah, it was a fairly short video what, what you saw you saw it at, at yeah. minus five seconds roundabout you saw the disconnection of the feed system of the um cryogenic propellants basically mm -hmm. they are coupled until the very last second of the of the start and then at T0, when the countdown comes to zero, that is the ignition of the Vulcan engine. That's the liquid hydrogen fueled engine at the center stage. Quite tiny. If you also look at the picture now from the launch, you, you just see a, a small blue flame. At once this ignition is confirmed and the Vulcan engine is running nominally, then the ignition command is given for the two boosters to the left and to the right and they provide 80%, 90% of the thrust of um, this initial flight. The boosters operate for around two minutes, then they are separated, jettisoned, and um, are recovered from the Atlantic Ocean. The Vulcan engine continues to fire roughly for eight minutes before it's also shut down and the entire lower stage is deorbited. And for the final phase, we have then the ignition of the upper stage engine. In the past, we had several types of engines. We had hypergoric propellants. We also have the, the HM7, which is operated with hydrogen and oxygen. Um, and this operates under vacuum conditions and does the rest of the job. So there are three fields of, um, of concern or three challenges we, we have to face here. One is the power. So the thrust at liftoff, for example, is roughly 15,000 kilonewtons, which we have to provide to lift the entire launcher up into the air and into orbit. There's another point to be taken into account, that's resilience. What do we mean by resilience? The conditions under which such a rocket engine system is operated and the propulsion system is operated are quite um, severe. So we have um, a significant acceleration during the first phases of the flight 
at liftoff we have roughly 4g so that's the fourfold of the of the gravity on earth and all systems have to be able to withstand this acceleration load in the beginning also the satellites the same applies for example for vibration and noise you can imagine and you already saw it in the video which was taken from some miles um, away that the noise level during launch is quite high so all these systems have to withstand these vibration shock loads and the, the noise level looking at the liquid propulsion system we have very extreme temperatures in operation as i mentioned before the vulcan is operated with liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen one is the fuel the other one is the oxidizer because we don't have any air up there so we have to take our oxidizer with us and the liquid hydrogen is stored at 20k that is minus 250 centigrade the liquid oxygen is stored at 90 kelvin that is minus 180 centigrade so very low temperatures all the materials have to withstand these very low temperatures and on the other hand once these in propellants are injected into the combustion chamber and are burned the combustion temperature exceeds 3000 centigrade so we have roughly 3300 centigrade inside the combustion chamber and all the cooling systems have to be capable of dealing with that so you can imagine the coolant circuit is operated with liquid hydrogen you have 20k and on the hot gas side in the combustion chamber you have the 3500 kelvin or 3300 roughly centigrade of the combustion going on and in between there is one millimeter of copper so lots of resilience needs to be provided by these systems and the third point up uh, i didn't see it because of my camera sorry is precision so there has to be precision of course for the positioning of the satellites because the customers pay the service to bring the satellite not just into orbit but into the right orbit at the right time this holds true of course for um, scientific missions for example if you have to reach um, an asteroid or something like that it's only a small launch window and you have to keep within that corridor to be able to fulfill your mission so the same applies also of course for geostationary satellites or other satellites they have only limited amount of fuel on board to do maneuvers or to correct their orbit and therefore it's of high importance that we put the satellite into the correct orbit that's the one part of precision the other part of precision goes into the field of quality assurance you can imagine that the systems with the high amount of power which is uh, put into force here are very sensitive to tiny flaws think about a crack in a seal or a, a small rupture this can instantly lead to an, um, catastrophic failure of the launcher you remember maybe the pictures of, of the challenger catastrophe stuff like that it's very very tiny effects which have catastrophic consequences if you don't take care of them so we have to be very precise on that and we have high measures in quality assurance to make sure that the launch is a success each time so the next slide is on how do we make it work at Ariane group as seen during the introduction Ariane group is a company where engineers from several companies in europe work together and it's not only the people at Ariane group who contribute to the Ariane rocket we also have numerous providers of piece parts who deliver parts to Ariane group which are integrated for the final launcher the images here show you the entire sequence basically from the design so that's the top left image <clears throat> from the design capabilities we have from the conceptual phase of a launcher and from the propulsion system which is required to provide the launcher with the required thrust at the given time and with that design you can start then of course the manufacturing after you have justified all the calculations and you can make sure that the design is able to provide the required performance and withstand the loads and the second image of the first row shows you a colleague of mine working in an additive manufacturing laboratory surveying the print job of one part flying 3d printed on an Ariane rocket apart from the manufacturing of course we have then very stringent and very um, deep going quality control measures there are two pictures in the in the top row one is a tactile measurement of the geometry of the combustion chamber before it's 
forward it to the next manufacturing step. And on the right hand side top, you see a 3D stereographic measurement of a bracket, which is later installed then on the flush chamber. So with every manufacturing step, we have a full 100% quality control of the parts to make sure that they all meet the, requir uh, the requirement in the specification and that the quality is okay. So there must be no, no leaks, no cracks, no bins, whatever. Once the part, parts are accepted for inst um, installation, you see on the, on the top and the bottom row, the different steps of integration. On the lower left, you see, for example, the equipment of a small uh, demonstrator thruster, which was 3D printed and tested last year. You see the different sensors being installed. You see pressure sensors, we measure temperatures to monitor the operation of the combustion chamber and to check the performance of the system compared to the predictions we did before in the design phase. On the second two pictures, picture two and three in the lower line, you see the integration of the Vulcan engine in Vernon. On the um, second picture of the left, you see that there's a um, robot helping to keep basically the, the parts in place while the colleagues integrate sensors, cables, stuff like that. Uh, what you cannot quite discern, there is already the Vulcan combustion chamber inside this chaos of um, feed lines and then um, cables and stuff like that. On the Third image in the lower row, you see then the nozzle being installed. So the entire setup is tilted by 90 degrees with the help of this robot. And the nozzle extension is being mounted onto the combustion chamber. So this is one of the last steps before the hardware is shipped for the acceptance test, which you see on the right hand side. This is one of the latest photos we had that was the acceptance test of the flight engine for the Vulcan 2.1 which is now made ready for the first Ariane 6 flight. I have a um, question, if you don't yep. mind. Of so uh, it looks like that rocket engine is being fired inside of a building. It is. <laughs> How does that work? Because <laughs> you just yeah, said yeah. 3,000 degrees Celsius. Yes, well, well, that's only in the combustion chamber. Outside, you have only 2,000 degrees. <laughs> I see. Oh, uh, okay, sorry, only 2,000. Yeah, yeah that, that's, <laughs> that's nothing. There are two dedicated test sites in Europe where these rocket engines can be tested for the flight. There's one test bench at Ariane Group in Vermont, and there's another test facility site in Germany of, operated by DLR, the German Aerospace Center. Um, and in these test facilities, they are, you must imagine they're a huge, like a, there's a complete building 20 meters high where the entire stage is mock up basically. Mm -hmm. So the, the propellant feed system in these test facilities mimics the flow conditions which will be the same later during flight. Yeah. The you reason I... The feed lines mm -hmm. and this are tested then in a building, of course, the doors are open to let out the mm -hmm. pressure waves. And you see here on the lower right image, the exhaust plume, which is ducted through a basically water cooled tube to the ambient. Because I have seen some uh, testing of rocket firings, perhaps not uh, space rockets, where mm -hmm. they're, they're assembled in a building and then the building moves, right? The, yeah. the whole building, because yeah. otherwise, but those are quite small buildings, I would say, relative to what maybe you're talking about here. Well, what you, what you can do, of course, you can, that's for the launch pads, for example, there you can move the entire building then towards the, um, towards the launch pad side. Um, mm. As far as I know, crew, that's not the case. So the, the launcher is integrated in one building and then shipped on a railway cart basically to the launch pad outside of the mm. building. Okay. By the way, if there are any questions, feel free to interrupt me at any time of the presentation. Or if you prefer, you can ask the question afterwards. It's just up to you. Okay, so lots of stuff to be done. For what engines? So I mentioned before, I work on the liquid propulsion domain. So I'm working on technologies which are suitable for the engines you see on the right and not the boosters which are produced in the southwest of France. In the large image, you see just the jettisoning and this artist's view how the, the um, burned out solid boosters are separated. Ariane 6 will have two liquid rocket engines, 
both fueled by liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. On the lower one, you see the Vulcan 2.1. That's a um, update of the currently flying Vulcan 2 with modifications in many parts. The most notable is, for example, the exhaust ducts you see on the right, on the left, these long tubes. This is the exhaust ducts for the gas generator and for the turbines. So why do we have turbines on a rocket engine? The propellants have to be fed somehow to the combustion chamber at very high pressure. We're talking about a feed pressure of 100 bar or more, even more than 100 bar with which the propellants are injected into the combustion chamber. And to drive the pumps, you need to have turbines. And therefore we have a dedicated small, tiny combustion chamber and you can see it maybe on the image of the Vulcan 2.1 in the, in the upper section and the center mm. part. There's one metallical cylindrical part. This is the gas generator where a part of the propellant is burned just to drive the turbines, which itself then are used to give their power to the pumps, providing the propellants to the combustion chamber. And what we you can see... Of course, yeah. We have a question from Nathan in the chat. Go ahead. Um, Nathan, do you want to ask the question yourself or do you want me to read it? I'll just wait a few seconds. No, no worries. All right. So if Nathan doesn't want to ask it. Uh, uh, so Nathan asks, how do you throttle the engine? So you were talking just now about uh, the different turbines that themselves mm -hmm. have engines, but I guess throttling would be a relative question of more or less or, or things like this. Very good question. And maybe an embarrassing answer. The Vulcan engine isn't throttled. It's, dry, it's driven at constant thrust and constant operating point for the entire eight minutes. Hmm. Um, throttling would be done by valves, which you can use to um, manipulate the mass flows for the turbines, for example. This allows you, like in, the gar like in a car, if you handle the, the gas pedal, to throttle the power you give to the pumps. And by that, you could throttle, for example, the power of the entire engine. This is a technology that is currently being developed for the Prometheus engine, which we will see later. Mm. And this key technology, if you want to have systems which are reusable and should return to Earth, for example. What you see in SpaceX, for example, they have to throttle down the engine because it would have far too much thrust for landing mm. operations. Yeah. I, I have a question. Was okay. yeah. yeah, I have a question too, now that we're at this picture. You mentioned earlier that the boosters come down and land in the ocean and then they are retrieved. Yep. Um, do they float by nature uh, because they're full of air now or do you have to get them before they sink or? No, it's, it's basically like that, that they are designed mm. as such that the air which is inside of them um, makes them float in the ocean after they have touched down. Okay. And I'm assuming you retrieve all of them. Are, are there any stories of lost ones where you really looked but couldn't find it or? <laughs> I don't know, but usually we retrieve yeah. all of them because they are um, inspected afterwards um, to see if the operation and the behavior of the boosters was nominal. Mm. And then do you reuse these or ones that are? Uh, no, they're not, they're not reused. Basically, it's only, it's a shell of, of steel which is retrieved and it's for quality assurance that we retrieve mm. them. Okay, and, uh, and then you also mentioned that, so in the stage that I see here, the, the, the long rocket that hasn't, mm -hmm. that's still connected, you said there's also another stage in there, so that burns for eight minutes, right? And, yes. And then you said you deorbit it. That's mm -hmm. not a word I understand. What, what does deorbit mean? It's, it's basically, well, it also drops down to Earth, but the, the more polite way to say it is to deorbit it, and if you do it in a controlled manner, not just drop it somewhere, it's, it's a yeah. deorbit. Okay, but do you retrieve that? Does it land on land? Like what? No, no, that's lost in the, if I help me, in the Atlantic Ocean, I guess it's still, I think the core stage is also deorbited in the Atlantic Ocean. Okay, but it sinks? Yes. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Yeah. So here the, the largest concern is the timing of the launch sequence and of the flight, of course, must be as such that the area where the stage comes down is uninhibited, uh, uninhibited. So typically it's in the Atlantic Ocean or in the Pacific Ocean. And do you actually check the, let's say, pa uh, path of ships, like big ship, like big uh, yes. container ships, yeah? Directly at the launch site in Kourou, it is such that for the first leg of the flight, when, for example, also the, the, the um, solid boosters are operative, the entire area 
and the sea is controlled by the French Navy and it's cleared during the flight. So they survey okay. the aircraft and with radar that this area, uh, the trajectory on the ground has to be clear. Okay, uh, thank you. We have a question in the chat from Anderson. Uh, Anderson, did you want to ask the question yourself? All right, he says, no, just shoot. So Anderson asks, is there any manufacture and testing work done at Karoo or is it only for launches? Is most of the engineering and development work done in France? It's such that engineering and development is done in France and Germany. We have dedicated sites which have specialized on certain components of the, of the engines or of the launcher, for example. Mm -hmm. um, manufacturing and testing in Kourou is done for the boosters. So there are the, the filling of the boosters is done in Kourou which is basically due to the fact that it's too risky to ship the, the solid boosters around the world because it's basically it's explosive. <laughs> Got it. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Any more questions for time being? I think that's it for now. Okay, so I'll, I'll continue. So we have the Vulcan engine on the lower right for the core stage or for the, for the lower liquid, liquid propulsion module. Um, which is in this artist's view is this image burn, this engine burning here you see the, the blue plume. Once this is, the tanks are empty and Vulcan is stopped. The um, first stage is separated from the second stage and Vinci operation begins. Vinci is the upper stage engine and you maybe see a difference in the, in the nozzle. So the, compared to the combustion chamber, the nozzle of Vinci is far larger. It's a far higher expansion ratio to which we expand the exhaust plume. And this is due to the fact that this engine not operates at ambient pressure, but at vacuum conditions. And here you can gain far more thrust if you expand the plume in a larger nozzle. The Vinci engine is different in its operation mode There we have no gas generator. Nevertheless, we have to, propel, uh, to, to pump up again the fuel, even to higher pressures. Here in the Vinci, the hydrogen, which is used for cooling the combustion chamber, is pumped up to a pressure of 250 bar. And we do this with our gas generator just by the heat, which we pick out of the coolant circuit of the combustion chamber. It's like a large heat exchanger. You take the heat of the combustion, you have to cool the walls of the combustion chamber anyhow, because the materials wouldn't withstand the temperatures. And with that heat, you can heat up the, uh, the fuel going through the coolant circuit it's already at 250 bar. And then you expand this heated fuel over a turbine which drives the pumps. So it's a far more compact system. It's a little bit more complex in operations because everything is closely linked to each other and the operation has to be even, or the predictions of the design have to be even more accurate to really get the performance you want. But of course, it's, it's a very smart system and the efficiency and the performance of such engine cycles is higher. So we have the two liquid engines, the Vulcan 2.1 and the Vinci. And well, what, what do I do now as an, as an engineer, research engineer in, in Otto Boom? And I have two examples where I would like to show you what we are working currently on and how we prepare ourselves for the future, how we tend to want to introduce new technologies. The first thing is, everybody loves it today, additive manufacturing. And if we talk about additive manufacturing, we're not just talking about the 3D printing, for example, of where we have brackets, for example, where actuators or valves are, are mounted, you could 3D print them. We will 3D print injector heads, for example, but we're not only talking about this printing process. If you do spaceflight hardware, you really have to have control and expertise for the entire manufacturing chain. And this basically starts with the powder, with the powder production. You have to make sure that, for example, the particle size distribution, the flowability of this powder is always of the same quality because the printing process is tuned to the um, properties of the powder. So there mustn't be any change in the properties so that your printing process and the setting of the printing process itself remains stable and repeatable and predictable. To ensure that and to make sure that you don't have any flaws in the part, for example, we also work with process simulation. Is the design of the part suitable for 3D printing? Are there any residual stresses which may lead to cracks, for example? Can we do some, um, some more, um, more robust design, for example, also for the printing process? 
And once we print the part, there are systems in place to do a process monitoring. That is, each layer of this 3D printing of the part is monitored via cameras, and we can afterwards detect if there were any anomalies during the printing process. And we have then catalogs. You see on the, on the second, um, second row, left image, you see these images we get from these process monitoring technologies. That is a, a false colored image of basically it's an infrared monitoring technology. And you see if there were any hotspots during this, this lasering printing process. And with a catalog established by um, experiments before, you can assess the criticality of such flaws, for example, or such process anomalies. And you can say, okay, stop here was something. We need to do a more detailed investigation on that, or the part has to be scrapped or the part is okay. This is not an, an indication for a critical error. I have a question. So are you yeah. printing metal? Yes. We are printing um, different alloys. We are printing uh, stainless steel for some parts of the engines. Um, mostly we are printing um, nickel base alloys. Okay. Have the, um, well, material properties which are required for these parts, so very high strength and a very high temperature uh, resistance. So you can operate them up to 1000 Kelvin, which would be um, 800, 900 degrees centigrade. So my, my understanding from what, I mean, so 3D printing has become quite popular and personalized in the last uh, maybe five years. Um, I, I understand the principle of heating up the material and then it cools again, but I get the feeling printing metal is not that simple. Um, not as simple as plastic, mm. or is it the same idea? You heat up the metal and then... It's, it's also, well, both either printing plastic or printing metal is simple if you don't have um, high requirements and quality material properties. If you just want to have a nice part, you can put in your desk. It's very easy to print metal. Hmm. You take some aluminum alloy, which has a low melting temperature, and you print it. That's it. Okay are dependent on reliable material properties, on the reliable surface finish, and on accuracy of the geometry, you have to put some more effort in, of course. Well, you mentioned that these materials have a, have a, a, a melting point, or they can withstand temperatures up to mm -hmm. a thousand. So that means you printed at hotter than a thousand, right? Or no? Yeah, well, basically that's done by the, by the laser. You see on the, on the top row, this image on the right, you mm -hmm. see the light of a laser. Basically, it's a laser light which is focused on the top layer of a powder bed. It's like in a sandbox, and you oh, always oh the the powder, powder once powder. heated. Exactly. Oh. And once this layer is finished, um, a spreader brings the new layer of power, and the process begins again. Hmm. It's layer by layer with a laser. It's selective yeah. laser melting. This takes a while, doesn't it? Well but it's far faster than doing the manufacturing process chain in a, in a classical way. This is why it's interesting for, for us. Yeah, because you print. In, injector head of Vulcan has more than 400 individual injection elements and they all have to be installed um, by hand, basically. This is mm. all has to be assembled, checked as and for accuracy. And if you can do this with a proper 3D printing design, you only have one or two manufacturing steps. You basically do the print job, you clean off the powder, and you do the inspection, and then that's it. Yeah, so and I imagine far, that's far, far, far quicker than with classical manufacturing. Yeah, especially because you probably print such specialized pieces that you don't need thousands of them, right? Exactly. And yeah. you, your design process and, and research process is so quick that by two st stages of rockets, you're at a new design. Um, interesting. So Volodymyr asks, uh, can you reuse the powder that is not melted? Um, yes, the powder which is not melted is reused. We also did investigations on that, on how often you can sieve and reuse, reuse the powder before, before the, the grain size distribution, for example, deteriorates. deteriorates. Mm. So the printing process is under inert atmosphere. There's no oxidation of the powder, for example. It's under argon atmosphere. Um, but nevertheless, um, this powder size distribution, which I mentioned before, starts to deteriorate with the third or fourth um, reuse of the powder. So it can be reused, but it's limited. Hmm. Okay. Okay, where will we start? Material properties. So we have to take care that the manufacturing process is such that we also achieve the correct material properties. You can do a lot of 
errors here and get very bad material properties if you do the printing process wrong. The surface finish has to be right. Um, second row, third picture is a part, um, an R&T project we did on printing of valve housings. Especially in valves, of course, you have very stringent requirements on the cleanliness of the surfaces. There mustn't be any particles on which get loose then once the fluid is flowing because typically such loose particles end up somewhere where you don't want to have them. So surface finish is a topic. You have to take care about the machining of the parts afterwards. So this design has to be as such that the machining process, which might be necessary afterwards, is as easy as possible and you don't get any dirt into the parts and stuff like that. The material and the printed part has to be weldable, of course, because we have some interfaces. For example, we want to fix the injector to the combustion chamber. So welding is a topic. Cleaning and inspection, and there's a nice picture on the lower left. We used in the past uh, computer tomography to inspect the injector heads. And you see there a cross-section of a model injector head, which we later fired on a research test bench. And if you would have a very good resolution, you could see the tiny details of the injector in that layer. So you can make sure with the CT scan that there's no powder residuals or, or cracks or something like that in the part. And this is something which you have to do if you want to build space parts. It's not something if you go for prototyping or putting nice parts on your desk, for example, or just doing that for the design. Once the cleaning and inspection is done, we go for functional tests. Injector heads typically are designed to provide a certain distribution of the mass flow for the injectors so that each injector gets the same mass flow rate and not one gets more and the other one gets less. And then we have functional tests like flow checks with water or substitute loops like gaseous nitrogen, for example. And once all these tests are completed and acceptance criteria are met, then you can go for hot fire test. On the lower end, right hand side, you see a photograph taken in the past on a research combustion chamber with a reduced number of injection elements. That was a fully printed injector head. And you see these, these small um, cables which are there. This is basically thermocouples which have been spot welded to the surface to monitor the injector face plate temperature. So we have a question from Manon um, who asks, can 3D printing be considered for nozzles in the future? Uh, um, yes, but <laughs> Yes, but maybe not this SLM process because currently, well, it, it always, of course, depends on your application. If you think about the Vulcan engine and the Vinci engine, the nozzles are too large currently for this SLM process. There are no such large machines which can build parts larger than 400 millimeters currently. So the maximum size currently on the systems we use is 400 millimeters square. Of course, there will be larger uh, machines in the future. And then you could print it also there. But there are other 3D printing technologies which are maybe more attractive for nozzles. If you don't have the very stringent requirements on the geometrical accuracy, or there are not tiny, teeny tiny holes like you have in ejectors, but only coolant channels like in a nozzle skirt, you can also do this by laser metal deposition. This is not as accurate, but accurate enough. And you have far higher uh, deposition rates of powder and the productivity can be far higher. So in general, yes, nozzles could be 3D printed, but the manufacturing readiness level and the technology readiness level is not yet as such that we go for flights with them. GKM yeah. and Sweden is working on that. Because uh, maybe it wasn't clear, but I think I've seen people standing next to that uh, engine that you had on the bottom right a few slides ago. And how big is that engine? Is it like the size of a bus or something. It's quite tall, isn't it? Um, you mean the, the Vulcan? Uh, uh, yeah. So on the lower right now in that image, mm -hmm. roughly three to four meters in height. Okay, so not as, as tall as I thought. I, no. I thought I've seen ones much bigger. Are there different rocket sizes that get much that, bigger? It might be um, if you go for, for the States and visit Cape Canaveral, I think there's an exhibition, an F1 from the Saturn V, which flew to the mm -hmm. moon. This is even larger. They're the diameter okay. of the nozzle exit is, I think it's roughly three, three meters or something like that. Wow. Okay. Any more on um, 3D printing and manufacturing technologies? Are there any more questions? I don't see any more questions right now. Okay. So we go to another nice topic. Laser ignition. Here I have some, some nice pictures from tests. So what is it about laser ignition? 
Nowadays, typically, the combustion chambers are ignited by um, solid propellants, basically a small explosive charge, which is ignited simultaneously with the injection of the propellants into the combustion chamber. Disadvantage for the lower stage, for example, or for, for any upper stage is you can't reignite the engine. Therefore, you would have to have a different system because you only can fire this um, pyrotechnic charge once. Um, you can do, of course, what for the Vinci system currently is a, a gas torch. It's a small combustion chamber in itself with its same feed system with some oxidizer and some fuel. And these are burned and it's basically, it's really like a, like a small torch and you point this into the combustion chamber and ignite the propellants. Um, disadvantage of such systems is they are quite complex in, in integration. You can imagine, I mentioned before, this torch has its own feed system, its own propellants. So there are propellant tanks, there are feed lines, there are control valves, um, check valves to avoid backflow of propellants. All this has to be connected via tubes. Um, you can imagine that this is quite complex in installation. And again, the quality control of these parts is quite an, quite an effort and every hour equals to several euros in cost. Additionally, these systems then can get quite heavy due to the high pressure in the systems. The, the wall thicknesses of the tanks, for example, is not negligible. And so we are looking for alternatives. And one alternative is a laser-based ignition system. So what you do, you basically point a laser and focus it into the combustion chamber, like you see it on the lower right. It's again, such a research combustor, you see the limited number of injection elements and you see that small light on the, on the upper, light, uh, upper left corner. And this is during the checkout of the laser to, to make sure that the focus point is correct. Here you have a plasma breakdown of the laser power, which results into the fact that the, the ambient gas um, gets this plasma breakdown. And with this tiny spark generated from this plasma breakdown, you can ignite the propellant. We developed such systems um, for all hydrogen engines now in an, in an R&T mode. On the left side, you see the latest results. That is a 3D printed combustion chamber for an upper stage engine. So the size would be like, like for Vinci, for example. And during the tests where we did the fire the 3D printed combustion chamber, we also used the laser ignition system to ignite the combustion chamber. Um, on the right hand side, you see um, the laser heads installed onto the gas generator injector of the Vulcan 2.1. So you see that the cables and you see the flanges for the supply lines and you see these brass colored two rectangular boxes. These are two laser heads which are installed on an optical system which allows you to direct the laser beam into the combustion chamber right at the right point to ignite the propellants there. We did all these tests at a research test facility. So this is not on, on real flight hardware. It's nearly identical to flight hardware, but not 100%. And the operation was done as to such to mimic as good as possible the transient behavior of these injector heads and combustion devices as if they would be installed in the engine. It's quite a tricky task to really get the filling process, for example, right, to have conditions as they would be in flight. But that's so also the how many how many uh, megawatts or gigawatts is this laser? Um, it operates only at, I think, 50 millijoule. So the, okay. the power of the laser itself is not that high. Hmm. The, the trick is to have pulses which last only for some nanoseconds. So we are firing a pulse train during roughly one second at 20 hertz. And each of the pulses has only, I think it's eight nanoseconds of um, pulse time. Hmm. And then you get several, um, I think it's megawatts of ignition power, very focused in one spot in the combustion chamber. Hmm. And I guess uh, you spoke to the importance of reignition systems, uh, mm -hmm. not least of which if you want to have rockets that can fly again, uh, maybe also in case the one charge you had before doesn't work properly. I mean, you just fire the laser again. Um, but what other considerations went into we should try laser ignition? Is it uh, uh, 
cheaper on fuel? Is it uh, more reliable? Um, like, what are some of the reasons why mm -hmm. laser ignition is the future? It's um, it's not cheaper on fuel. It's cheaper on installation and integration cost. So the entire system is easier to install and to inspect on the launch pad, for example. Um, and it's it's more flexible. For different propellants, you can adapt it for different injector head geometries. Mm. Um, so you can always use that laser and don't have to, to bother about um, the propellant combination you want, you want to ignite. Of course, you have to demonstrate it that it works, of course. <laughs> so far, for hydrogen, and we did methane. Mm. Um, researchers in Russia worked on kerosene. So the one thing is the cost of installation, integration, and checkout. The other thing is the, the mass or the weight of the system. For the lower stage, for a Vulcan, you don't care because this um, is negligible. But on the upper stage, every kilogram counts. For us, every kilogram we do not use in structure or, or um, system mass can be sold basically as payload mass. And this is what, where we earn the money. Mm. So it's reducing the mass. Okay. Okay, if there are no more questions to the ignition systems, we can switch to another video. There's a video on the Prometheus program where they develop new technologies for next generation engines. And I'll just start that video. So that was the, the promo video about this Prometheus concept. Um, and this is basically a technology precursor to be used also for technology development for Ariane 6 in future evolutions or the next launcher also. By heavily using additive manufacturing and better co-engineering than we had in the past in the different companies, we aim to reduce the cost of such a combustion chamber and the, the entire engine by a factor of 10. Currently, the combustion chamber is prepared for ground tests. Manufacturing is ongoing, and the ground test, uh, the tests of the engine will start next year. <laughs> 